Hey guys, the Network Berg here. Hope you're doing well. In this video, we will just be revisiting some of our topics in the previous video, which is namely, we're going to be looking at how routing just works in essence. We're going to be talking about the route selection process again, and we'll just be implementing some very basic static routes so that we can get between some LAN networks on a very focused scope. So in this video, we'll be actually revisiting a lot of the previous video, but I want to engrave this information into your into your head so that you can just reference this better for any upcoming videos the next video we will be discussing policy-based routing so something to look forward to anyways thanks for watching and i'll catch you in the video now bye let's talk about routing and some route theory because I know a lot of people get intimidated when it comes to routing on Microtik or any device really. It's a bit out of comfort zone for your standard user, especially if you've never really done a bit of routing. And it's similar to VLANs. A lot of people, it, it just feels, I don't want to say iffy, but they're not used to it. So they typically don't fiddle around with it much because we're creatures of habit. But I can tell you now, routing is amazing. It's our bread and butter as network engineers. And you should definitely get comfortable with routing because it is going to be something that you do a lot of the more you advance in your network engineer career you're going to build networks you're, you're going to be responsible for building roads between different devices and networks to make solutions work which is awesome so look forward to that i'm just trying to get you to a point where you understand how routing works now i'm also changing up my format a little bit with this introduction video usually i'll have eve topology open now and i'll do stuff on eve we'll get to eve in a bit i just want to do this theory on a little chalkboard right now so we can talk about it now let's think about routing um, i'm just going to draw here because i want us to understand routers or routing involves routers and these circles that i'm drawing will be basically telling us these are routers and all of these routers, they have some or other connection to each other. It might be wireless links, it might be fiber connections, um, it might be even satellite. Like at the end of the day, a network comes down to a bunch of routers that are connected or interconnected with each other to learn and advertise and tell people how to get to places. Now, I'm just going to focus on one specific router in this instance right now and this is this bottom left router and i'm just going to call this a provider edge because when you work in an isp network you're going to see a lot of devices of this caliber called the provider edge which is essentially the edge of the provider's network which will be where they're going to be delivering service from it might be triple poe services it might be like i said the wireless or fiber services might be mpls can be a myriad of different services but what the provider edge does is it will then uh, form some type of connectivity to your customer or your remote site and from there we will also find a router or a device which we call a cpe which is short for the customer premises equipment now this cp is just a router and the router will then obviously connect to some type of switch perhaps and the switch will connect to servers and computers and whatnot but this is how we will typically be getting internet access. Now I'm painting a very specific scenario here because with this customer provider edge, this blue stuff that I've drawn now, this is what people are typically used to. They're not aware of all of the routing that happens in the back end on the core network. And let's just add another device perhaps. Um, let's add another circle, but I'll change the color for it to perhaps just be white. Uh, let me just put it up here somewhere. And now this circle will then also just be a router that's going to connect to perhaps some type of web server. Sorry, my head is a bit over it, but you get the idea. So at the end of the day, when we're talking about packets that want to be routed, we want somehow for a source, like a computer, to be able to maybe get to a web server so that it can open a website and see what's happening. It can browse the internet. It can go to YouTube and watch a video like this. And... Let's just dive into that process quickly because there is a bit of a process involved when we are routing packets and essentially your computer all devices have a routing table as i mentioned in the previous um, video so your computer will look at its routing table it will see if it has routes for the ip address of the web server that you're trying to reach 
If it doesn't have a route for it, it will just forward it off to its default gateway, which would be our CPE, so our router to break out to the internet. Now this is where stuff gets interesting because our router that goes, our CPE, like I said, would be connecting to a provider edge for our ISP network. Now the provider edge would also just receive a copy or it would receive that packet from your CPE if it gets forwarded. But what's happening in essence is every time the packet gets forwarded, so when it gets from the computer to the CPE and the CPE sends it to the PE, something happens. There is a source and destination IP address inside an IP header. And this IP header basically exists on top of the layer two frame just to identify where the packet is meant to be going to and where it came from. So the moment um, you want to get to a specific destination, the destination will stay, stay the same on your IP header. But what's happening is the source and destination MAC addresses are being updated the whole time because it will see the, the new source MAC address would be of the CPE, but the new destination MAC address would be of its new gateway where it's going to push the traffic to. And this process keeps being followed between routers where it will then update the MAC address table or the MAC addresses on the packet until it can eventually get to the router that is directly connected to that server. And then it would be forwarded off to the server where the server can then respond and follow the same path to get back. So in essence, that is how IP packets work, what they do. So this is just a brief introduction to the routing side. What we also get is a route selection process. So besides the traffic just being routed across different routers, we also have a selection process to decide which routes are the best. Now, this is being decided by the routing table of each and every router. So each router has a routing table. The router will look at the routing table. It will then look at an assortment of different things like the longest prefix match. It will look at stuff like administrative distance. It will look at which routing protocols it learned the routes from and which routing protocols it might prefer it from. You even have separate stuff for the BGP route selection because BGP has additional attributes and works a bit different, but we'll cover BGP in a, in a completely different course. Don't worry about it. We'll be looking at OSPF in this course though. And another important thing on Microtech devices is before any of that route selection process starts, the router will then also just look at its firewall rules. So when I talk about that, on Microtech, there's stuff that you can add, stuff called mangle rules, or you can have IP um, route rules, which in essence allows the router's firewall to make decisions on where or how you want to route traffic. Now, this is also very useful for stuff like policy-based routing, because then you can mark certain packets, like you could say any HTTP connection or HTTPS connection you want to route a specific way, then you can do that with a mangle or firewall rule. In the same line or vein, you have also your VRFs. So a VRF we will also discuss um, after a bit of the routing videos, but VRF comes down to um, you can have multiple different routing tables existing at the same time on a single device, on a single router. So you could have VRFs for specific customers or for specific services, but the router will always have its own main routing table, which it uses to form its own connectivity. And then you can have VRFs as well. So when a packet is received, we'll first look if that packet is part of any type of VRF or firewall rule, like a mangle. And then after that, it will then look at stuff like your longest prefix match, which is which cider is the shortest. Is it a slash 29 or is it slash 28? Because a slash 29 route would be preferred over a slash 28 any day. Uh, similarly, again, this is then when we get to our administrative distances where the router will see which distance is the shortest to get to a route. And based off of that route selection process, it will then forward the packet to its appropriate gateway. And that gateway could, in this topology, because we've got this little triangle here, it could go either way. And this is where we can then set stuff to make sure that traffic goes the way that we want it to go, which is really nice, really awesome in the routing world. All right, what I'd like to do now is I'd actually like to go into EVE and then we'll set up a few static routes again, just to embed that knowledge that we worked on in the previous video. So let's get into that. So I'm just going to open up um, my VM quickly. 
And then from my VM, I'm just going to swap my screen back to my actual YouTube recordings. And this is the topology we've worked on in the previous videos or video. And we'll keep working on this topology to add more routing services that we'll be using. I'm going to keep this simple and just on point for the static routes again. In the next video, we'll cover policy-based routing. So all that I'm going to do in this topology, and I'm going to drill down in this little network on the bottom left of router two, router four, router five, and router six, because what I want us to accomplish in this video is we want the LAN subnets that's sitting behind each of the routers to be able to communicate with one another so that we can have some type of LAN connectivity between different routers. I mean, it, it doesn't just have to be for offices. This could be extended onto the network where you might have towers that you're running with some LAN ranges, and this is how you can just get to those towers then. So we're going to just accomplish this with some basic static routing. And what I'd like to do is I'm going to configure routes on the router too to say how to get to each of these um, LAN networks at the bottom. And we're going to specify our WAN IPs of each of the routers, which is in essence dot two. So I just need to update this dot five and dot, or sorry, dot six and dot 10. Because we have some slash 30 networks between our provider edge in this case and our uh, CPEs, because I want you to think of these bottom routers as our CPEs. So these gray networks are the link addresses, or it's probably not the correct terminology we want to use, but this is the subnet that we've defined between our provider edge and our customer presence equipment. So let's quickly set up routing on router two, and I'll connect onto Winbox to get this done quickly. So let me just open up Winbox. And then what we'll see is I'm going to connect to router two via the ROM on. And there we go on router two. Now from router two, let's just zoom in and let's just look at the router's routing table. Because as I've mentioned, each router has its own routing table to decide how it's going to get to a specific destination. Again, you've get, you have stuff like your default route, which means anything that does not fit into the routing table, it will just send it over the default route. And if no default route exists, traffic will just get dropped. So let's add a few basic static routes to our LAN subnets. So I want to get to 192.168.0.0/24. So from router two, if I want to get there, I'm going to have to use 10.0.0.2 as my gateway for that. So let's add that route. To get to 192.168.0.0/24, I will use 10.0.0.2 as my gateway. I'll apply that, and then I can be quick about it by just copying a route with uh, Microtech as well, and I'll just update it to .1. And to get to .1, so 192.168.1.0/24, I must go to 10.0.0.6. So I'll use that as my default gateway. And then lastly. We need to get to 192.168.2.0 slash 24. And for that, I'm going to 10.0.0.10. I'm going to apply this. And now that that's been applied, I have three active static routes to get to the LAN networks of those CPEs. Will anything work yet? I'm not sure. We'll have to check. And to do this, I'll log on to router 4 quickly. And I might just do this from its command line. So let's see. If I look at router 4's routing table, I do an IP route print, I currently only have my connected routes. So currently it's not really going to work. And if I want to just make this work very easily, what I could do is just add a default route out to my provider edge. And then my provider edge obviously knows how to get to all of the subnets. So let's quickly add that. IP route add destination 000.0/0 gateway. 10.0.0.1, which is the WAN IP of router 2, which is my provider edge. So from the CP, I'm routing all traffic to the provider edge now. I'm going to do the same on my other CPEs quickly. So IP route add destination 0000 slash 0, gateway 10.0.0.5, which is for this middle link. And now the last link, which is router six, 
instead of adding a default route for router 6, I'm just going to add specific routes like we did on router 2. So I'll do IP route add destination 192.168.1.0/24 and the gateway for that is going to be 10.0.0.9 and also for 192.168.0.0/24. So if I look at router 6's routing table, we can see I've got these two additional static routes. I don't have a default route out, but that's okay because the goal of this video is just to establish connectivity between these three sites using the provider edge. So let's quickly see if this works. So from router 6, all I'm going to do is run a ping to 192.168.0.1. I'll run the ping and I am getting a response. And what I'd also like to do is, what I do recommend is whenever you test this type of setup, also try and specify a source address. Now, if I specify source address with a ping, it's basically going to ping from a specific source IP, which in my case will be 192.168.2.1, which is the LAN network. So I can see that works. Perfect. And... Yeah, that, that, that's actually it. What, what else we could do is just maybe check on our LAN networks if this is working. I'll just do an IPDHCP on this machine for router 4. And I'll do an IPDHCP for the machine at router 6. And let's just put them next to each other so you can see both of the screens at the same time. So the PC that was connected on router 4 is 192.168.0.254. Let's see, can I ping 192.168.2.254, which is the IP address of the PC connected to router 6? And that I can ping. So what we've done now is with some very basic static routing, we've set up a way from our CPEs to get to our provider edge. And now all of these LAN subnets can communicate with each other with the static routes that we as administrators defined. So this is where I'm going to wrap up the video. I'd like to thank you guys for watching and I'll catch you in the next video where we'll be discussing policy-based routing. See ya.